Hello there. Welcome back to another episode of the Camarada Podcast. This is Andres Marquez, your host, as always. Uh, this has been it's been about three months since we've recorded our last episode, and about two since our last episode has gone up on uh, the internet. So I'm very excited to be able to start doing interviews like this with uh, new folks uh, from all around the world, no less. Speaking of, we have with us today Marta Skera. Is that how you pronounce your last name? Skora. Skora. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I was way off. My apologies. <laughs> Well, why don't you take it away, Marta? Um, whoops, brain fart. This happens about once an episode. I lose my train of thought completely. Um, but yeah, I think I was asking you to introduce yourself to our lovely audience, if you wouldn't mind. Of course. Well, my name is Marta. Um, I'm in Oslo, Norway. Um, I, I grew up on this little farm. Um, on the west coast of Norway. Um, I still try to be there a lot. So I guess I, well, I say that I'm a part-time farmer. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been studying all kinds of things, uh, journalism. I even went to Michigan to study environmental journalism for a semester. Oh. Um, then I went back to Norway, to Bergen, studying meteorology and oceanography so really like the physical part of the climate system mm. then i went uh, to oslo again to do a master in human geography but really focusing on, on climate change adaptation and social transformation um and i guess it was while i was studying that i kind of started to do these climate projects um, the first one was climate, uh, climate cards, the climate cards. Um, when I was in Michigan, I learned about this blog or this project called the Freedom Cards, where this, um, this person was asking people what freedom meant to them. Um, and I was like, well, I'm studying journalism. I can ask people something. <laughs> And then I was like, well, what do I think is the most important question? And I started asking people how to solve the climate crisis um, and having them wrote, write their answers on these small cards that I started posting on social media. Um, while I was doing my master's, I, I was doing this internship with the UN Comet Secretariat in Germany. And I developed this project with my supervisor that turned out to be Climate Illustrated. Um, it's also a social media project where we collect people's stories, personal stories about climate change. We have stories from people all around the world. Uh, and we work with um, digital artists who, who illustrate those stories. When I was done studying, I, I started working for a NGO here in Norway, working with the sustainable development, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But although it was meaningful in a way that we were trying to change politics and, um, you know, it was a pretty traditional approach, I guess, you know, lobbying, um, traditional communication. So I just quit. <laughs> To, to keep up with my projects and do that full time. Yeah. So that's me. That is absolutely beautiful. I have, uh, that whole life story is just, it's very inspiring, honestly. Uh, and for those who uh, haven't seen this yet, Climate Cards and Climate Illustrated are both uh, two internet slash social media based projects uh, built to build awareness for the climate justice movement and about the climate crisis. Um, and they're both wonderful projects, honestly. Uh, climate Cards is just... that That's how I first discovered you and your, and your work. I don't, I don't know how it came about, but I came across your Instagram page, the Climate Cards page, and I just kind of get just like scrolled uh, for maybe about six or seven minutes straight just seeing all these like 
lovely photographs, people, you know, sharing uh, their side of the climate struggle. Um, it's honestly, again, it's very inspiring stuff. Uh, so yeah. if, you, if you don't mind me asking specifically about your other uh, project, Climate Illustrated, um, what sort of, excuse me, how, how do you go about organizing all the different, I suppose, facets of the Climate Illustrated project? Because uh, on your homepage, I see that there is a sort of story competition going on, uh, I guess, to, to foster climate action, to motivate climate action. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on as well. You're collecting stories uh, about, you know, the struggle against climate change. Uh, there seems to be a lot going on just in this one single project. So how do you go about organizing all of this? Do you have uh, a team behind you? Do you... Um, you know, do you collaborate with people on a regular basis or is this more of like a of a solo thing? We do have a team, a wonderful team um, of volunteers. It's me and um, Mikala, who is uh, in San Francisco, actually. She was we were both interns um, with the U.N., um, so we kind of started a project together. So in the beginning, it was just us. But then just through Instagram, people started like messaging us, wanted to to be involved and take part and help out. Um, so now we're about 10 people, I think, uh, both people helping out collecting stories. Um, and also we have three artists on the team who are like um, more more you know part of the everyday work in a way uh, I think in total we probably have collaborated with uh, yeah at l- more than 100 artists at least um, in illustrating the stories when we when we started we were thinking that the hard part w- would be to get someone to illustrate stories um, and that collecting stories would be kind of, you know, easy in a way. <laughs> but then it turned out to be the other way around. That there's a lot of artists and illustrators who really want to help, um, to help kind of lift these voices and who cares very deeply about these issues, about climate change, the environment, nature, and just social justice in general. Um, but... What kind of seems to be more, who kind of turned out to be more difficult was actually getting people to tell their stories. I think it's a little bit difficult, like the format of of a personal story, you know, Mm. speaking about our own memories and feelings and ideas. Um, I think often, at least when it comes to climate change, we tend to focus on other people like the politician should do this and my neighbor should be, you know, not driving his car and people should vote differently and everyone else should do something different. And we tend to focus a lot of what's outside of us. Um, so just writing uh, about yourself um, and being personal in a way um, is maybe not what people are so used to. Um, so the story collection process is actually it takes many forms, many shapes. It's um, you mentioned the the writing competition. It's a project. It's the first project we actually got funding for to do. So we had this writing competition in Norwegian schools. It was me and a colleague here in Oslo. We went around to the schools, had workshops. We were talking about climate change about their hopes for the future, how they can use the skills they already have to kind of contribute to to, to the climate movement. Um, and these youth um, submitted their stories. Um, ten of them were illustrated by our artists, and the exhibition is now hanging around in two different places here in Oslo, both at... Um, the Climate House, which is part of the Natural History Museum, and at this really cool library here in Oslo, which is actually the first public library in Norway. Mm, 
so that's like the competition part but most of the time it's we just we just when we see someone on instagram or somewhere else who might have an interesting story we just contact them and ask them if they want to if they want to share then we try to help them uh, write up their story as best as we can um, we also developed these storytelling workshops to help people kind of um, write up their story, but also just um, kind of get them to think about what their stories are. Like, we truly believe that everyone has a story to tell, but very often people don't feel like that themselves. Mm-hmm. I was having a story workshop with some students from a Canadian university a couple of weeks ago and almost everyone started you know first I do this little presentation where I tell them a little bit about like how they can tell their stories just some tips I guess and also I share with them like an example of a story that was shared for through a project Mm -hmm. and then we have this round of sharing where people are just like sharing their stories you could I just invite people to share an experience that was important to them related to climate change or the environment or really anything that was important to them. And then I guess my point is that most of them start their story or their when they speak, they just start saying, I don't really have a story to tell, but, <laughs> and then they tell this amazing story. Um so I think just, I guess like back in the days we had a lot of, mm, a lot of, it was maybe more normal to just tell stories. Like, I guess you had to go really long back before you were sitting around the fireplace telling stories. But, you know, just imagine before we had television, <laughs> how much more storytelling by people were. Now it's more like, mm. you know, we're all, listening to the same stories like we're all let you know we're all on netflix seeing the same shows exactly. uh, so we have these stories that are told by like reached by so many more people but they're told by a way fewer people we're not necessarily used to telling stories ourselves you know mm-hmm. so i think it's good to create spaces where we can actually do that yeah, that that is wonderful. Honestly, that's not that's something I don't think I've thought of either. the The fact that we have so few people telling stories nowadays, but so many people mm-hmm. listening. Um, do you feel that in your own experience, it's difficult for you to tell your uh, your individual story regarding you know climate change and uh, the environmental justice movement? Do you think that? you know, doing these projects has helped you improve in, you know, telling your side of this, you know, multi-billion sided story (laughs) going on? So do I find it hard to tell my story? Hmm. I think so I like in the big picture in a way, like I'm a very, you know, very privileged person with access to social media. And um, so I I don't think I would say like in general that it's very hard for me to tell my story. But I think what is hard in a way for everyone is to kind of find their story, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that was has been difficult for me as well. Like, you know, (laughs) what is my story in a way, you know? Um, and also, I, I, stories are, you know, there's not one story about one person. Your story can kind of be a little bit, your story is a little bit what it, you think it is, you know? Mm-hmm. I've been struggling with this a little bit lately um, because I guess the very reason why, like, I always cared a lot about nature, the environment, um, But when I was young, um, I was not really engaged in any kind of activism or I was just not involved in politics or or anything. I 
I'm a horse girl. <laughs> like I, I would be outdoors all the time, just like training my horses with my friends. It was my passion. Um, and when it came to everything that was, you know, all these challenges uh, in the world, like what's happening to nature, what's happening, you know, war, what's happening to people, all these, you know, injustices in the world. I did not want to... I did not want to read about it. I did not want to take it in, really, because it's really painful, you know? Mm -hmm. When I was started to study journalism, I had to start reading the newspaper. And I just remember, like, when I was reading the newspaper back then, I would be, like, crying and sometimes, like, screaming at the paper. You know, it was some years ago, so we had I had a paper, like in real paper <laughs> in front of me. And I remember like screaming to the politicians that I was uh, reading about in this newspaper. Uh, very emotional. <laughs> um, but I guess what happened is that uh, this tiny farm that we have um, on the West Coast, um, my father kind of inherited this farm together with his three brothers who wanted to sell the land to developers and eventually they kind of that's what happened you know um my uncle sold this little piece of land um and they got money <laughs> and my father and our family kind of got the rest of the land who the developers couldn't develop <laughs> in a way Mm -hmm. uh, so we still have the farm, but now it's kind of, you know, we have all these vacation homes all over it. You know, the machines came and kind of dig up the soil and put new soil there and blew up parts of our mountains and cut wow. down trees and put these small streams underground and, you know, built these homes all over and it feels strange because you know we should be so happy to have one home and <laughs> why should anyone have two homes when so many people don't even have one you know it feels just strange like why do we ruin nature so people can have multiple homes <laughs> um but I guess I it kind of made me realize that no matter, like, you can't really shield yourself from the injustices, from capitalism and from the systems we're in. It will find you in a way, you know, mm -hmm. and impact your life because that's what the system does, you know. It creates loss for people who care about nature, who care about land, who care about justice. And that's why, that's why I wanted to, to become engaged and, like, do something, you know. That's why I started the Climate Cards. That why that's why I started Climate Illustrated. Um, and I guess what I was saying about you know the story and what's our story and you know can we choose what our story is? <laughs> because I've been so angry, you know, with my uncles, but the people who bought these houses and these vacation homes. And I, I guess for 10 years, I kind of just ignored those people, pretend they weren't there. But then this summer, or last summer, <laughs> I guess it's a new year, um, I was doing, you know, I was going about the farm with my father. We cut the grass and we were, you know, turning it around to make hay because it, like I said, it's a tiny farm and we don't even have a tractor, to, like a big tractor to cut the grass. We had this little tiny machine that my father kind of pushes in front of him. Mm -hmm. And we really just cut the grass because it's how it's always been done. Like on these flower meadows, like if you don't fertilize the meadows, the wildflowers, they really thrive there. And if you, if you cut it like once a year, um it keeps being this this flower meadow you know the trees doesn't take over or the bushes so we kind of keep up this tradition and yeah I was just going around with my father turning the grass making hay and I was doing that in front of these huge windows you know of the vacation homes where people were sitting either inside of their 
cabins or out on the balcony, like sunbathing while I was, you know, going there doing the work. And it felt so strange. So I kind of just was thinking, okay, if we're going to be here doing this work, these people are still going to be here. Um, I just have to kind of relate to them in a way, kind of try to, to at least give them the chance to have a deeper connection to this land where they randomly ended up, you know, um, mm-hmm. try to share with them the importance of, you know, taking care of these wildflowers. <laughs> um, and I kind of started thinking of my story instead of being this, you know, great injustice that was done to the land. I was just trying to think of it as, you know, a story of healing, like, can can I work with these people um, to, to actually take care of this land with them, you know? Mm-hmm. I guess I always wanted to conserve it, you know, keep it the way it is, but when converse like conservation is not possible anymore can like can we care for something together and i think i think capitalism kind of uh, at least it creates a big need for care and for this kind of you know community healing in a way and like healing their relations and the land which is so broken up mm-hmm. by the system. Yeah. So yes, I think it's always kind of hard to to find our story, also because they always keep changing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really. I I do agree with that. I think that somebody's story is definitely evolving as they evolve as a person, and it's very mm-hmm. hard to say that one person even has one single story about them because in the end i feel like everybody's you know life stories are entwined with the people that they know and the people that they affect indirectly through their actions and i don't know it's a very confusing thing to try and explain oneself without really explaining the other people involved in making them yeah and i I think that's such a beautiful thing you know this kind of I, I guess that's, like you said, when you start thinking of your story, you, you realize how important other people are and you start to see these connections and interconnections that, yeah, it's it's a good thing. Indeed it is. I, um, I don't know. I feel when I was a bit younger, I had a very similar experience to you, you know, going through your learning journalism and going through the grief that comes with discovering how cruel the the masters of this world have kind of uh dealt our fates um i would ride the train to cal state la every day and i'd be very very depressed uh just having seen some bit of news on the internet or on the television and just very much trying to avoid it and it took me about a year and a half to really be able to I guess drag myself out of that um, mm. but I think one of those things that did help was understanding just how many people are in this fight against this immense injustice uh, dealt to the mm. earth as a whole you're definitely right it's not just something that's been done to the land it's oh, let me close the windows real fast it's not just something that's been done to the land it's been done to you know, the people and who inhabit it and the many Mm. species outside of humans that inhabit it. Um, And just understanding the sheer immensity of the, I guess, the, the the groups, all of these different organizations and all of these different individuals who are fighting the same fight um, for a better future for everybody, everybody living and everybody who might live soon. Um, that's what that's what's that's what kept me going, and it's what still keeps me going. And mm. I guess that's kind of why I like doing these interviews, just to hear how people are contributing to the contributing to a future that we can all want to live in. Yeah, 
I guess same with me, you know, it's, that's the motivation in a way behind both Climate Cards and Climate Illustrated. I just find it so inspiring reading the stories that we collect because they just show how much people care about these issues. Mm. And how it's people from all over the world and from, yeah, just people with so different stories, so different backgrounds, different motivations, but what we kind of have in common is this deep, deep wish for, for, like you say, a world that we actually want, Mm -hmm. um, where the builds on these other values, a world that is just, um, and that kind of acknowledges um like you said that we are connected <laughs> mm-hmm. that you know other species matter that nature matter that um we are connected although we're um really far apart and i think that's all also what the climate cards show sometimes i had this great experience where i i wrote you know Uh, During the school strikes for climate, I was a student and I wanted to take part. Uh, But this one Friday, I wasn't in Oslo, uh, where I would normally go in front of parliament with other students and youth. Mm -hmm. So I was on the farm and it's uh, by the sea. So I was writing this sign. I can't even remember what it said, but it was something about like taking care of the ocean and the creatures who live in the ocean. Uh, And I didn't have anyone to take my photo except of my father. So I dragged him down there to take the photo. (laughs) Um, And this, I posted it on Climate Cards and it was shared a lot of times. Uh, So it reached people around the world. And then I think a few months later, um, I was tagged in this post by a student from Indonesia who had remade the the sign that I did. Like she put the same words on there, just that her looked way better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and she had taken a photo of herself uh, in front of the like ocean where she lived. Uh, and she sent me this image and I also shared that one. Um, on comic cards and you know it's just it's just such a way way a nice way to to connect with someone that's so far away like I never met her I never talked to her I just like wrote to her you know on Instagram we wrote for them back and shared these photos she also shared a story for Climate Illustrated it's one of the very first stories that we shared um so so yeah, I think, I think it's definitely one of the things that keeps me going in this work. Just like you say, knowing that you're not alone, that there are millions out there who cares a lot, cares a lot. Oh, absolutely beautiful. That is, that just brings a smile to my face. Honestly, that's that's one of the that's another thing that gives me hope. Really, about you know not just climate, but the entire the entire injustice that capitalism Mm -hmm. creates and all of its different forms. Um, The thing that gives me a lot of hope right now is the interconnectedness of all these different movements fighting for, um, you know, a nice clean future wherein we do not have to worry about our survival and we do not Mm -hmm. have to worry about, um, I suppose at the very least we don't have to, we can at least work, towards a better future without having to fear that this work will you know collapse due to some bureaucracy or due to some government's infringement in any case it's the interconnectedness of it all it's the fact that you can communicate your message and somebody all the way across the globe as you said in indonesia 
can can hear it and they can respond to it and they can be just as inspired as somebody within your home city. I think that that is it's one of the things that grants me the most hope, seeing all these people from around the world who are sharing in the struggle and who are sharing their collective hope to create something far larger than can be created in one's own backyard. Yeah. I wrote my my master thesis about hope, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a topic that interests me a lot. Um, we, we tend to focus hope on positivity um, and this idea of like, you know, improvement in a way that things will be better, that things will be safe. Um, with climate change, you know, kind of having studied like the physical science of it, it really, it really poses this question if, if it's possible in a way, you know, um, maybe the future will be more, um, more, there will be more risks in a way, you know, mm -hmm. it will be less stable. And we're saying that we're all going to be okay would be almost unethical, unethical because already climate change is causing these, these large catastrophes and taking and ruining people's lives. Um, so while I've, I, of course, hope that we can we can create a future that is good for everyone and that is just i i do feel that what i'm trying what i try to do for myself is kind of decoupling my hope from the results of our work mm -hmm. i do believe that whatever happens in the future it matters how we respond to climate change and these other challenges that we face is our response a just one? Do we practice, you know, solidarity? Um, do we, is our response based in justice, connection to the land, connection to other people, in peace? <laughs> you know, I I feel it. I feel it makes a big difference. Um, so, I guess. When it comes to hope, I always try to think that what we do matters, not necessarily for some result in the future, but just like you say, for some people in the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, and also that hope is this wondrous thing that we can actually create, you know, that we can share. Uh, so when we do something, we can create hope both for ourselves and others, um, which is also quite meaningful. Um, so I guess in the work I do, I just I try for my efforts to be meaningful here and now, so that whatever results they may or may not lead to in the future. It's, you know, that's not what my motivation is tied to in a way. If you understand, does it make any sense? No, no, that does. It's. A, I think that's a very, I feel like that's a very good balance of working towards a future that is very, at this point, is very ambiguous. It's very hard to yeah. understand what could happen even within the next six months, or year. Yeah. It's a good balance of working towards bettering an ambiguous future with bettering your here and now. Yeah. And I do think that that is, um, it, it could be perhaps the healthiest way to go about it. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know. But it <laughs> seems like, I don't know, a lot of people work as though the what is happening at this moment is what matters the most. And I think mm -hmm. that's not anybody's fault in particular when it comes to those people working in such a way. 
I do think that our current state of being is one in which we are kind of driven towards, you know, I, I suppose working for, for the short term, as it were. We are driven towards making sure that what we want to happen next week or what we want to happen next month uh, happens the way we want it to. Yeah. I think that there's that going on. And there are a lot of people who are focusing, again, on years from now. And mm. I never see a balance of the two. So it is very yeah. refreshing to hear that from you, Martha. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit like in, like when, when thinking about talking to you today, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, art, activism, and the future. And this might sound a little bit like, you know, talking against myself because I was just talking about like the meaningful of hair now, but <laughs> I sometimes find myself living in the future a little bit when the here and now feels um, a little bit too, I don't know, like surreal or just stupid in a way. Like I said, with the vacation homes, like mm -hmm. why do we need them all? Well, we don't, but why do people feel that? And then sometimes when I pass those uh, small houses, I just pretend like I'm in the future and it's not vacation homes anymore that they are houses inhabited by people who actually needed a home so that they actually, you know, came to good use, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know who lives there, but maybe, you know, maybe in the future a climate refugee, you know, mm -hmm. who came to this place and needed a place to stay. Maybe they can occupy these small houses. And it feels a little bit like like performance art in a way <laughs> to just kind of try to live in the future a little bit but not but in the future I want you know mm -hmm. in the future in a future that is different in in a good way that kind of helps me cope with the now I, I love that honestly I think it's very how do you say keep saying these words like inspiring and whatnot but that's that's the word that comes to mind honestly it's it feels very refreshing when you know that there is a solution it might be a difficult solution to achieve for one person or even for mm -hmm. many people given certain circumstances but the fact that you can imagine a better world i think that that is a big part of this uphill battle the yeah. fact that you can imagine like, oh, this land that was once, you know, farmland and is now um, kind of a symbol of excess. I can imagine this, um, these resources being used in a way that would be more equitable and in the long mm -hmm. term, perhaps create more happiness for people who might have otherwise not been able to grasp that. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I think that's uh, again that's one of those things that I like seeing from this interconnectedness of society at this point seeing so mm -hmm. many people who are able to like dream up these big new futures and of course some of it definitely <laughs> I don't think it's technologically possible of course <laughs> uh some of it is very much science fiction but I don't know it is, it's always lovely to see people who are, at the very least, not only discontent with what is occurring, but who are willing to, to show the world that there are alternatives. Yeah. If you don't I, mind. Oh, my bad. Yeah, <laughs> I just, I just really, I love that you, what you said about, like, you know, this capacity to, to imagine a different future. Um, I think it's. We can be so rational at times as humans that we almost forget that the only thing that we know for sure is that it, things will change, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's almost a little bit strange that it's so hard for us to imagine something different. Um, but it's like alternatives seem so crazy until they're the reality, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's one of the things that art can really help us with, um, you know, to see the future that is not there yet. And that's one of the reasons I love uh, that we have, you know, illustrations for the stories and not photos because, you know, photos are always from the past in a way. They can never be from the future while art can can picture the future as well. We had this one really sad story from a young woman in France who was speaking about how when she was a kid and would walk to school, she would see a lot of dead um, what is like I forgot the English word you know these tiny long animals that live in the soil and kind of turns the soil around they're really useful like earthworms you call oh, them yeah that? earthworms yeah. earthworms she would see all these dead earthworms and in her story she was saying that she really missed seeing them and she felt that it was weird to say like miss seeing dead worms that's strange but it was because you know they weren't there anymore um and her grandfather on this farm would see say that he didn't see um, as many birds any longer there was a dramatic in decrease in birds because you know it's their food um but she would kind of end her story with this hope that the earthworms and the birds would would come back and you know there is if we if we kind of act and live differently there there is this chance that they actually might come back because nature has this incredible uh, capacity to regenerate and bounce back mm -hmm. uh, so then you know the artist working with her story could could picture her in the future when all these birds and the earthworms were back again um, which is just a more hopeful way, I guess, to to represent the story. Indeed, that's I never really thought about that missing earthworms. Mm. I suppose you're you're right though. Regarding their their place in the ecosystem, it can be easy to to miss something so so vital once you understand how vital it is. Yeah. If, well, if you... Oh, my bad. <laughs> no, I was just reading this book about gardening. And of course, you know, earthworms are really important for gardens as well. Um, and this, it was a, written by a scientist. And he just said that like earthworms, like we have no, we see them less, like, but the only measure we really have is observation. Like the one from France, you know, from the story and other observations around because like we we don't have like a count of how many earthworms is there and how many are gone. And it's, it's strange, you know, it says so much about their priorities. Like we're not counting worms, although they're probably one of the most important things on the planet, you know, mm -hmm. they make the soil so that food can grow while we spend all this, like all this, amount of energy on counting money, you know. <laughs> uh. ah. My bad. I had to readjust my back for a sec. One sec. Ah. All right. So if you do not mind, uh, we are going to wind down the, the little podcast. Uh, thank you again so much for wanting to be on this, uh, this first episode in months. This was an amazing conversation that we've gotten to have. We've gotten to have my bad my brain um i do want to ask before you know before we turn everything off um if you would like to share or how would you say if you'd like to shout out anybody in your creative community uh that you think you know you'd want to share with the audience some it's something that we like to do at the end of every episode where we have somebody say oh yeah there's this person in my community doing like art murals or whatnot and there's this person who's writing, you know, a book about something. Um, you know, we just like to try and make this as communal as possible, spreading the word about the people in the communities that we 
appreciate and care about. So if you'd like to, you can have the floor on that. Yeah. Um, I I was not quite prepared for that one. I would have so much to say, but I think I'm just going to do it like, you know, something that I, I have in my head. And I think I would just like to to kind of share um, the the three artists that we have on our Climate Illustrated team. For sure. Go on ahead. Yeah. So it's, um, you can find them all, uh, on Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. It's um, Carolina Altavilla. Um, that's all her Instagram handle is Car Caro Altavilla. That's mm -hmm. our artists from Argentina just moved to Italy. Oh. Then we have um, Ashley Quay. Uh, on Instagram, you find her as the Wild Quay. And she's from uh, the US. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, Luisa Hesse from Germany. Uh, on Instagram, you find her as Luffy, uh, dot Nesse. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to share with uh, everybody listening uh, a group that I am very much happy to be associated with. Uh, oh, hold on. One sec. Oh, there goes my back. Ah, that's good stuff. Yeah, so if anybody is in the Los Angeles area listening to this right now, I encourage you to please check out the Downey Pride Alliance. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, I suppose, in the know about Los Angeles County's many cities, uh, Downey is perhaps one of the most conservative in the city uh, and have had many representatives who have tried to uh, I suppose, attack in various ways the rights of uh, LGBTQ folk. So the Downey Pride Alliance is um, a group that has sprung up within the past year or so who are doing fundraisers to build uh, spaces that are inclusive for LGBTQ folk and who have uh, recently been planning to put on a Pride March in the city of Downey. Uh, again, please uh, support this group. You know, you can follow them on Instagram. We will put their Instagram handle in the uh, in the caption or whatever you call it. And um, oh, words are failing me. Yes, um, they we are planning fundraisers within the next few months. You know, bake sales and sort of stuff to help support the Pride Parade that should be occurring, I suppose, towards the end of this summer. Uh, but yeah, do check out the Downey Pride Alliance. They are a wonderful group of wonderful people. I will check them out for sure. And please. <laughs> thank you very much, Marta. And um, thank hmm? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you really much uh, like for this conversation. It's been um, really, really nice. And for this lovely podcast, uh, for all the work that you do. Oh, thank you so much, Marta. You're so kind. I am very much... Um, it's an honor for me to be able to speak with you, honestly. You are an incredible person who has put some amazing work out into the world. Uh, and again, for those of you, um, well, I gather that you were here at the beginning of the podcast if you're here already, but please check out Climate Cards and Climate Illustrated. Uh, there are so many different facets to Marta's uh, projects, and there are so many different artists involved with Marta's work. Uh, illustrators and storytellers, all this sorts of stuff. Uh, it is a big wellspring of creative energy. All right, that will be it for today. Thank you once again to everybody who's listening. This is Andres Marquez, your host as always. Uh, stay tuned for another episode. It should be coming soon, but I don't know when it will come. In any case, thank you for listening. Adios. <laughs>